Berthier renewed his protestations and pretended to be hurt at the bare suspicion. Nevertheless, he failed to convince the emperor, who dryly replied to him, Go, Berthier, go to Paris. You have also other business there, but I predict that we shall never meet again in whatever assurance you may give me of your return. I place no dependence on it. Berthier proceeded to Paris and never more appeared. The emperor was buried in reflections upon all the circumstances which he fancied must have preceded the recall of the House of Bourbon. It could not be otherwise. I know that he did me the little justice at first as to believe that I had taken part in that event. Oh, my goodness. I know that he did me such little justice at first as to believe that I had taken part in that event. When in writing from Fontainebleau to his brother, Prince Joseph at Blois, he made the following observation. You tell me nothing of the minister of police. Prince Joseph, in his reply, did me the justice I was entitled to. I was not heard at the emperor's question. It was a natural consequence of the events which took place within his view and which were calculated to make him suspect everyone. There were, besides, many officious beings about his person who were glad to feed his suspicions. Nevertheless, I experienced most bitter regret at being unable to take leave of him. This was wholly out of my power. Otherwise, I should have felt the utmost indifference at the hints thrown out against me, having always entertained the utmost reliance on the sentiments emanating from the emperor's mature reflection and paid very little attention to the opinion of those who were about him. But I repeat it. My attendance was utterly impossible. Calicor alone was allowed to go and come without molestation because he had the charge of regulating whatever concerned the emperor's interests. It was not until the 23rd of April that this prince felt himself unable to take his departure. During the interval of nearly a fortnight which he passed in this manner of Fontainebleau, the particulars of the events which had altered the aspect of France had been communicated from one extremity to the other. That extensive country, the vilest publications emanated from the press and excited to the work of reaction. All those virulent attacks had preceded the emperor on the road he was about to take and kindled the popular rage. It was fortunate for him that the precaution was taken of having him accompanied by commissioners from England, Austria, and Russia, a very monarch who had been the exclusive object of the attachment of the French, was compelled to seek the attendance of his enemies about his person in order to escape the revengeful feeling of Frenchmen. This painful extreme is a fact too well established to escape being recorded in history. The commissioners repaired to Fontainebleau and were presented to the emperor as safeguards for the protection of his person. But it was to the full as much with the view of being prepared against the projects he was supposed to entertain as out of interest for his person that they were sent to him. Nevertheless, they proved of essential service on the way through Provence. Those three individuals were a man of honor who did not quit Napoleon a single moment and who discharged their duty with honorable punctuality. On the day of departure, the troops took up arms and ranged themselves in the courtyard of the Palace of Fontainebleau. The horses were already put to the emperor's carriages, which were in waiting at the foot of the great staircase, according to custom. Previously to entering it, he felt desirous of taking leave of his troops and coming up to the guard. He addressed them with great animation the following words. Soldiers of my old guard, I bid you farewell for the last 20 years. I have ever found you treading on the road to honor and glory in these later times, no less than in the days of our prosperity. You have ever shown yourselves true patterns of courage and fidelity. With such men as you are, our cause could never have been lost. But the war would have become interminable. It must have been a civil war. The wretchedness of France would have been the more complete. I have sacrificed all my private interests to those of my country. I am about to take my departure. As for you, my friends, continue to serve France. Her happiness was my only thought. It must ever be the object of my wishes. Pity not my fate. If I have consented to outlive my political existence, it is that I might still be instrumental in promoting your glory. I will write the noble deeds we have achieved together. Farewell, my children. Would that I could press you all to my heart. He desired the eagles to be brought to him, grasped them in his embrace, and resumed. I cannot embrace you all, but I do so in the person of your general. Farewell, my soldiers. Prove yourselves at all times worthy and gallant men. This scene had drawn tears from their eyes. Great is our loss when we lose such a man, said they to each other. The allies are well aware 
of what they are doing when they tear him away from France. The emperor was nearly stifled with emotion. He was compelled to offer violence to his feelings in order to force himself away from the ranks of those gallant soldiers. He stepped into his carriage and drove off. In his painful circumstance, I had the good fortune to render him a last mark of my devotedness to his service. The following was the occasion of it. Immediately after the occurrence of the events at Bordeaux, I had sent some agents to that city for the purpose of ascertaining what might be done. They had found the public mind disposed to join in any attempt and came to inform me of the measures they had adopted to drive away the enemy. The news of the abdication reached them on the road. They stopped at Orléans and fell in with the other agents recently arrived in that town, but with views of an opposite nature. They entered into conversation and ascertained the motive of the excursion of their comrades who had proposed that they should join their party. My agents refused, reached Paris in all haste, and quickly apprised me of their having met a gang acting under the orders of the former equerry of the Queen of Westphalia, who were watching a favorable opportunity of rushing upon the emperor and putting him to death. I lost no time in dispatching a courier to Fontainebleau, who, as good fortune would have it, arrived in proper time. The necessary precautions were adopted. The assassins dared not venture to attack some 40 lancers who composed the escort when they fell upon the equipage of the Queen of Westphalia, which they plundered. It has since been pretended that Maubroya had no other mission than to obtain possession of the crown jewels and to seize upon the treasures with which the emperor might have raised a party in his favor. I know that this pretense has been made use of with the view to obtain from the chiefs of the enemy's army the orders calculated to procure any assistance that might be required by the party sent to follow the track of the emperor. But this was highly ridiculous, for it was impossible to send on the 17th after property, which was already in the hands ever since the 9th. It has further been alleged that the provisional government no longer existed at the time of Mount Roya's mission, but this assertion is incorrect, since the orders which were intended to secure the execution of the plot bear the signature of Brienne of Dupont, of Balin notoriety of Angla, all ministers of the commission over which Mr. de Talleyrand presided. The following details, however, will establish the opinion which ought to be entertained of the object contemplated by Mount Broya and his employers. I extract them from a judicial investigation, the accuracy of which has never been contested. The mission of Mount Broya and his accomplices had two objects in view, an attempt upon the emperor's life and the carrying away of the property belonging to his majesty and all members of his family. Mount Broya was long acquainted with Rue Laverie, an intriguer who availed himself of the catastrophe of the 31st of March and of the favor of the Prince of Benevento to obtain his nomination as Secretary General attached to the provisional government. Rue Laverie was the person to whom Malbaraya directly addressed his entreaties after meeting with a refusal from Monsieur de Semayet. It is certain that for the last three months he had been every day to visit him as much for commercial operations, which they contemplated carrying on conjointly as in respect of political affairs, with which Rue Laborie was thoroughly acquainted, and Malbroya ardently desired to be concerned by distributing proclamations of and good words. He returned home at seven o'clock at night and found five or six notes from Rue Laborie written in the following terms. Make haste, then. Why do you not come? How can you keep one waiting so long? You really drag me to despair. I have an hourly expectation of seeing you at the prince's residence. Malbroya stepped into a carriage and proceeded in all haste to the prince's hotel, where Labrie introduced him into Monsieur de Talleyrand's closet and asked, Have you eaten anything? No, replied Malbroya. I have not since morning. I've been running about town the whole day. Well, then go and take some sleep. I pledge my word of honor not to tell you a word of the business. Never mind the soup and say what you want. No, my word is pledged. Go take your soup and be back in an hour. An hour and five, an hour and ten minutes at the least. Remember that I expect a great act of self-devotedness from you. I've answered for this prince and ventured to trust. I am not mistaken. You know, my dear Laborie, that all my actions and sufferings aim at the object of recovering the rank I was destined to fill in the world before the revolution. Born an only son with a large fortune, I feel the most poignant regret when I consider that my name and my existence 
are, as it were, extinguished. Do whatever you please, so long as you put it in my power, even at the repeated peril of my life, to reach the goal which has always been the dearest object of my wishes. Very well, but be off immediately. Return in an hour at the latest in an hour and ten minutes. I cannot listen to a single word more. I must leave you. Be gone, be gone. Malbroya went away in his carriage, stopped to take some soup at the house of Rich, the restaurateur, on the boulevard, and returned at 8 o'clock to the prince's residence. Library was in attendance at the council, being informed of Malbroya's return by the first messenger of the council chamber. He went to him, took him by the hand, led him to the same closet as before, made him sit down in the prince's armchair, and addressed him in these words. You are a man of tried courage and firmness of character. You have an unbounded ambition. It shall be gratified beyond your most sanguine expectations if you succeed in the matter to be entrusted to you. A profusion of wealth and honors are in store for you. You will receive 200,000 francs a year, be raised to a dukedom, and made a lieutenant, general, and governor of a province. But be prepared to run great risks. Can you, between this and 5 o'clock tomorrow evening, make sure of 100 men of resolute character? This is what you are to do. You will proceed to the headquarters of Prince Schwarzenberg. You will reach, receive money, horses, and whatever you may demand. Well, what do you expect of me? Well, it is our wish, my friend, that you should rid us of the emperor. The emperor dead, France, the army. Everything gives way to us. Do you possess sufficient courage and resolution? Come speak out. If an act of assassination is what you required, replied Mabroya, I cannot answer your purpose, and surely cannot be the subject you propose to me. Oh, that concerns yourself, sharply interrupted Labrie. Do as you please, manage to rid us of him, but lose no time. Proceed tomorrow to headquarters. A great battle must be fought, whether you succeed before or after. is of little consequence. What we want is to get rid of him. A hundred men are too many. I only require a dozen on whom I may rely. You must give me power to promote two or three degrees above their ranks those who may do faithful service they must also be allowed pecuniary rewards in like proportion you shall have all you desire to live read do as you list what matters it to us after all whether we have 10 or 12 colonels and other officers more or less Will you wait the prince's return he's at the senate he will repeat all i have said to you do you wish to see him it would be of no use it's really quite useless, replied Mabraya. Do as you please. I trust wholly to your word. My knight will be engaged in going about to collect a dozen such individuals as I want. Thus ended the conversation. We give it in Mabraya's own words. But it is quite clear that Library explained himself in much more positive language on the extent and multifarious objects of the mission. True to his agreement with Labrie, Mabraya repaired to his house at five o'clock in the morning of the 3rd of April. At the hour of nine, he had not yet returned. Mabroya went to the second appointment at the residence of the Prince of Benevento. Library spoke only these few words to him. You have yet the whole day to prepare yourself at the hour of five, my friend. At five, I shall be with you, said Mabroya. I am quite glad of the delay, for as everything is in utter confusion in Paris, I was unable to make my preparations during the night. At five in the evening, Malbroya returned to Labrie, who spoke to him as follows. At nine o'clock, my good friend, at nine, we have great news, the best possible news, but keep yourself in readiness and return at the hour of nine. Malbroya returned to the prince's residence at the appointed hour, and Labrie began the conversation. My friend, we have excellent news. Marmont has been prevailed upon to come over to us with his army. It appears that the other corps are on the point of doing the same. Several proposals have already been made to the marshals. We expect every success. Malbroya asked if this news interfered with his mission and what he was to do. It certainly does not interfere with your mission, replied Labrie. Be still in readiness, but let us wait till tomorrow. He then had a long conversation with Malbroya, who has transmitted to us some fragments of it. Are you aware, said Malbroya, that royalists, Bonapartists, constitutionalists, all are clamorous against the prince? It is asked what he intends to do, and I also must ask you for my own government whether he is working for the Bourbons. But it is always so with Paris, Celebrity. Scarcely two days have elapsed since their deliverance from the yoke, and they already complain how unjust people are. 
believe me, my friend, when I assure you that this very day, and in the very place where you are now, I stood trembling for the Bourbons from the hour of noon until four o'clock. It is painful to acknowledge that the house of Bourbon has been trifled in a most cruel manner. Monsieur de Calincourt thought on three occasions that he would gain the ascendancy over the Emperor Alexander. What efforts has it not cost us to succeed? Add to our difficulties the subject of the regency. Austria, on the other hand, besides the Emperor of Russia, so wavering and so exhausted that he consigned, as it were, to Monsieur de Nissel Rota the task of giving the casting vote on that important question. You may now form an estimate of the obligations which the House of Bourbon are under to Monsieur de Talleyrand. For my part, I may also add that I'm quite exhausted. I never saw anything to be compared to the labors of this day. To what means were we not compelled to resort for the purpose of wresting the declaration from the Emperor Alexander? You can form no idea of it. At last, however, we have succeeded. The decree of forfeiture will be pronounced tonight, and tomorrow the Bourbons will be recalled by the Senate. The result of this conference was to postpone, but by no means to abandon the execution of the plan, and Labour reassured Mount Broya that if eventually the enterprise should not be carried into execution, the prince would be equally beholden to him and procure him a reward for his good intentions. On the following morning, 4th of April, Desis called upon Devonto in order to ascertain the day of departure. Mount Broya came in at the time and said to him, Our departure is only delayed for a few days. From the 4th to the 18th, Mount Broya repaired Four times a day to the provisional government, he sent to Prosper Barbier, his servant, a great number of notes to Labrie, but he furnishes us with no details of the correspondence of so active a nature, nor proceedings so often repeated. He merely states that he presented several persons to Labrie, and amongst the rest, Daisies, Montbadon, and General Montelagier. The latter was witness to the very earnest manner in which Labrie told Mel Broya to attend immediately to drawing up of his commission to Marechal de Camp by General Dupont, the Minister of War. Daisies acknowledged that he often accompanied Mount Broya, but insisted that he always remained in the antechamber during this interval from the 4th to the 18th of April. Mount Broya and Daisies adopted many steps which it is of importance to relate as they are connected with one of the objects of their mission. The news of the emperor's abdication arrived on the 12th of April and created no change in the arrangements of the prince of Benevento who aimed at the absolute overthrow of the imperial family and it is affirmed by Malbroia in the most positive terms that he can have no doubt on the subject after all that this has been said to him in the interval between the abdication and the receipt of his own instructions by abdicating the crown. The emperor laid down his arms. Accordingly, the mission confided to Melbroya could no longer form that moment be considered in any other light than as a project of assassination. He acknowledges it himself and alleges frivolous and contradictory excuses which only tend to prove his excessive embarrassment and the impossibility under which he finds himself in justifying his conduct. He says that he was obliged to retain the mission confided to him because it was a state secret and that by refusing to accomplish it, he would have met the most unbounded confidence by the most consummate treachery and draw down upon himself the resentment of Monsieur de Talleyrand out of the Comte d'Artois, whom he considered from the several reports made to him to be fully acquainted with the premeditated plot on the 16th of April before the hour of noon. Mount Broy with disease in his company paid a fresh visit to Labrie, who handed him several letters from the Minister of War, the Minister of Police, and the Director General of the Posts, and said on leaving him, my dear friend, do what you please and as you please with the effects of all the boat apart. You have a carte blanche in everything, over everything, and for everything. The prince places so much confidence in you that he is persuaded no one but yourself could properly answer the object he has in view. With regard to the expression used by Labrie, do what you please with the effects of the Bonapartes, Malbroya observes that the cloak under which they had agreed to conceal the real object of their mission was a pretended search for jewels and other property belonging to the crown. He replied Labrie in these words, I give you my word that I will do the best in my power. And I hope to succeed in so effectual a manner that everyone will be satisfied. 
At 6 o'clock in the morning of the 23rd of April, Mount Broya called upon Rue Laborie and related to him the particulars of his journey. He pretends that he was enjoined or rather advised him to give up all idea of compassing the emperor's death, adding that for his part, he could undertake no more than to carry him off and convey him to Spain or any other country which the Prince of Benevento might point out to him. Laborie, on hearing this, was unable to conceal his agitated feelings, which betrayed themselves and his countenance by a convulsive movement. He replied in the following words, My dear friend, what can be the meaning of this? Can it be possible? Am I really at a loss to understand you? At any rate, that matter concerns you. For my part, I will have nothing to do with it. It was your business to act so much the worse for you if you fail. I give you my word that I would not answer for the consequences of the mischief you are about to occasion. He uttered a few more broken, incoherent words which divulged the extent of his embarrassment. Matt Royer spoke to him of the chest of the Queen of Westphalia. All that must fall upon you and... If the Emperor of Russia should grow angry, the prince will have nothing to do with the matter. The criminal proceedings were followed up and the imperial solicitor near the tribunal of the first instance for the Department of the Senate came on the 16th of June to the following conclusions, considering that it appears from Mabroya's admissions that Monsieur Rue Laborie, in his capacity as Secretary General, attached to the provisional government, gave him in several conferences held on the 2nd to the 18th of April, either at the Prince de Talleyrand's residence or at the Tuileries, where that government held its sittings, the mission of assassinating the Emperor, as well as the Prince Joseph and Jerome, and to carry off the King of Rome, and that previously to the Emperor's abdication, Melbroya had accepted the mission, that he certainly alleges in his defense, his having no other intention than to act the part of a gallant soldier at the head of a troop of resolute men during the battle which was expected to take place, which excuse is doubly frivolous. First, because he acknowledges that his troop was to be clothed in the uniform of the Imperial Guard, the clearest indication which could be afforded of his intention to glide through their ranks under the cover of a disguise and to kill the Emperor in a treacherous manner. Secondly, because the Prince Jerome and Joseph were not with the army, that after the abdication, the object of the plot underwent no alteration, and Mabrea persisted in the determination to carry into effect, fearing, as he himself admits, lest he might be visited with the resentment of the Prince of Penevenzo and the Comte d'Artois. That, if the ostensible motive of the pretext of the expedition was the recovery of the jewels of the crown, or funds allegedly to have been carried away by the imperial family from Paris and from several public departmental chests, a convincing proof that the mission had a much more important object in view, which it was feared openly to acknowledge, is to be found in the very text and nature of the orders in Paris given to Melbroya on the 16th and 17th of April by the ministers of the provisional government. Accordingly, a decree of that government bearing date of 9th of April and inserted in the Bulletin des Lois, the Bulletin of Laws, enjoin all civil and military authorities to stop the passage of those funds and to deposit them in a public chest without the smallest delay. Now, if the mission had had for its object the search after or seizure either of those funds or of the crown jewels the Paris conferred upon Melbroya were, in this hypothesis, nothing more than a consequence of the decree, a means of securing the due execution of it. No mystery would have attached to them, and the mission conferred by those powers would not be announced as a secret one. In the order issued by the commis commissary of the Department of General Police, that Mabroya, on his journey to Fusar, sent Colleville to Fontainebleau for the purpose of watching the movement of the Emperor's departure and the movements of the Prince Joseph and Jerome, who were then in the direction of Blois. That on leaving Fusar after the robbery of the money at Jules of the Queen of Westphalia, being fully aware that the Emperor traveled as far as Lyon under an escort of 1,500 men of the guard, Mabroya adopted. The determination to proceed to overtake him beyond that city of circumstance necessarily leading to the inference that he intended to assassinate the emperor and not fight him in battle. That if he preferred returning to Paris, this was done not only with the view of accompanying the article stolen from the Queen of Westphalia, but also to connect himself with three or four persons on whom he might depend for the purpose of placing himself at the head of a detachment of cavalry wholly devoted to him and with a certainty of being in time to overtake the emperor who only traveled by easy journeys. 
that on arriving at Chailly on the road from Fossard to Paris, he ordered Lieutenant George, who escorted him with the few chasseurs of the guard, to proceed beyond Lyon, there to wait for the emperor, that when he reached Paris, he wrote to the ministers of war and of the police that he had not yet fulfilled the main object of his mission and had merely secured the chest of the Queen of Westphalia which would no doubt be found to contain the crown jewels still missing, that he often saw Rue Labrie, who broke out into the strongest expressions of displeasure and of reproach against him, that on the 25th of April, after a long resistance on the part of Rue Labrie, it was agreed between them that the emperor's life should be spared, but he was to be carried off and conveyed to Spain, from which circumstance it evidently results that up to the 25th of April, Rue Labrie had ordered and Malbroy had taken upon himself to effect the assassination of his majesty. That Malbroy, in short, according to his own acknowledgement, has persevered until the time of his arrest in the intention of executing that part of the plan, at least which related to carrying off the emperor and was again preparing to depart with the view of accomplishing the object of this second mission. Considering in respect to daisies that he was repeatedly called upon rue labri the company malbroya that he received from the ministers of the provisional government orders of a nature precisely similar to those given to malbroya that he accompanied the latter on his journey and did not quit him for a single moment that he was ever since the third of april in the secret of the conspiracy preparing against the emperor's life, that he admits his having encouraged Malbroia to return from Fossard to Paris in order to associate some other person with the undertaking and to take along with him a new, more numerous detachment of cavalry, pointing out at the same time to his notice the moment at which he ought to overtake the emperor beyond Léon. That upon its being observed by Monsieur de Vitrol that two chests were missing, one of which contained money, Monsieur de Vanteau had it intimated to Malbroia by Prosper Barbier, his servant, that he would be shot unless he immediately restored them. That Prosper brought in the evening to Monsieur de Vanteau the dressing case of Prince Jerome, the planks of the chest, originally containing the 84,000 francs in gold which chest had given way, and four bags, apparently full of money, which Monsieur de Vanteau neglected to count that on the same evening or during the night, Monsieur de Vanteau, accompanied by Malbroia, Daisies, and Prosper, deposited into Monsieur de Vitrol's hands at the Secretary of State's office the dressing case the remains of the chest and the four bags, the contents of which were not ascertained, considering that from the facts above related, it results first that the Prince of Talleyrand appears to have entertained or listened to the idea of procuring the assassination of the Emperor, of his two brothers, the Prince Joseph and Jerome, and the abduction of the King of Rome in the month of April 1814, that he also appeared to have availed himself of Labore for the purpose of committing to Malbroia and Daisy's the execution of the plot, but considering, on the other hand, that he has not made any direct proposal to them and has not personally taken part in any interview or negotiation with them that there only exists against him, the declaration of Malbroia and the presumption that Rue Labore would not have ventured to procure for Malbroia and Daisy's the order entrusted to them without obtaining the prince's sanction, considering the probability that the three agents who signed the said powers under the date of the 16th and 17th of April, 1814, must have known the object of the mission for the accomplishment of which those orders were issued that one of them, a commissary in the Department of General Police, gave to that expedition the epithet of a secret one, no doubt with the view of concealing the criminal object of the mission, which he was afraid of avowing, but considering also that the Court of Justice derives no positive information on the subject from any of the declarations, and that, in short, those agents may possibly have received the plain and simple order to issue such powers without being previously initiated into the secret of the conspiracy formed against the lives of the emperor and his family, considering that from the facts above related, it results that Rue Labrie is arraigned with having in the month of April 1814 proposed to Melbourne a mission, the object of which was to assassinate the emperor, the princess Joseph, and Jerome, and to carry off the king of Rome. Secondly, that Melbourne and Daisies were are arraigned with having accepted the mission offered to them by Rue Labrie. We demand ETC. Malbroia's attempt 
was the only one made against the emperor in the first days of his journey, and no place from Fontainebleau to Avignon was any one of respect shown to him on passing through Lyon, which was occupied by Austrian troops. He left his valet behind to wait the arrival of the post from Paris and bring him the newspapers with all the work circulated over France and growing out of the existing circumstances. He continued his journey and shortly fell in with Marshal Augereau. The latter embraced the emperor, expressed his deep regret at his misfortunes, and spoke to him with the same respect. As heretofore, they had scarcely parted when the emperor was overtaken by his valet. Amongst the public papers, which the latter brought with him, was the monitor containing the proclamation issued by the same Marshal Ogre wrote to his army unannouncing to it the return to the House of Bourbon. It was replete with infections against the emperor, whom he dared to accuse of cowardice. Nevertheless, he had come to erase him. This may be easily explained. For all those who have known the marshal are aware of his being incapable of publishing such a document. I was informed by the person who drew up the proclamation addressed by Ogaro to the troops under his command on the occasion of the return from the island of Elba that Fouché composed the first proclaimed object. Chapter 14, the attempt confided to Malbroia had failed to success. Another was organized at Avignon. Emissaries had been scattered about the town and found no difficulty in exciting the passions of the mob. It welcomed the emperor with cries, which indicated a thirst for his blood, and it was already showing a disposition to attack his carriage when Monsieur de saint Paulin the commandant of the National Guard and afterwards chief of a squadron in the corps of gendarmerie and the king's service hastened with a PK to the spot and arrested the progress of those wretches, some of whom had already laid hands upon the carriage door. He kept the remainder in check and the emperor drove off without any other accident. It happened otherwise, however, at Orgon, a small town in Provence. An officer who rode at full speed before the carriages in order to get the horses in readiness had so far got the start of them as to be able to discover the criminal intentions entertained by the people of that district. He saw the crowd had collected and that there were agitators among them. He retraced his steps until he came up with the emperor to whom he reported what was going forward. The danger was most imminent. It was not clear that the foreign commissioners would succeed in enforcing respect for their character. A deliberation was held, and it was agreed that the emperor should instantly put on one of their dresses and that they should all ride to the town at full speed until they had escaped all farther danger. It was of such a nature that having entered an inn for the purpose of drinking a glass of water, the hostess, who fancied she was speaking to strangers, said to them, we are in waiting for him. We shall see whether we will see he will succeed in passing through without being killed. This frightful wretch was confiding her guilty hopes to the emperor himself. He retained his disguise until he reached the residence of his sister, Princess Pauline, who lived in the vicinity of Nice and waited there for Generals Bertrand and Drouot who were coming on with his carriages and had narrowly escaped being torn to pieces. These occurrences were not of a cheering character. The emperor therefore refused to repair on board the vessel which was in waiting for him. He embarked on board the English frigate Le Domptable, cruising off that coast and reached the island of Elba, where he was joined by the small band of soldiers who had resolved to share his banishment. I forgot to mention that previously to leaving Fontainebleau, the emperor had for his private servants a French valet and his Mameluke, whose devotedness to him appeared to be unbounded. He had met with him when a child, brought him from Egypt, had him properly reared, and settled a small fortune upon him, which placed the Mameluke under any circumstances beyond the reach of want. This poor lad was assuredly impressed with the idea that he ought to expose his life in defense of the emperor, and he nevertheless deserted him in the night preceding the departure from Fontainebleau. This Mameluke was by no means a heartless man, but he was weak and suffered himself to be seduced from his duty by the French valet, who having formed the resolution of deserting his benefactor, followed the example of all cowards and sought an accomplice to back him. He perverted the heart of the poor Mameluke, who previously to the commission of this guilty act could never have suspected himself capable of it. Their desertion left the emperor without a single valet. It became necessary to find one 
out an hour before his departure. I had been some days in Paris and had occasion to call upon Monsieur de Talleyrand. He was with the valet and kept me a long time waiting. I was at a loss to account for the circumstance that could have brought them into contact. He explained it himself, or at least he hinted the matter. As soon as the Mameluke was gone, Monsieur de Talleyrand came up to me and informed me with an air of satisfaction that the Empress was not going to the island of Elba, that she had been for a long time a victim of the ill usage of the emperor who was very harsh towards her in short he held so extraordinary a language respecting domestic affairs which i was better acquainted with than himself and respecting which i had formerly a very different opinion that i plainly perceived he had not disdained to extend his system of seduction to the very servants of the emperor he had set to work all those who had any influence over access to the empress for the purpose of inducing that princess to adopt a determination calculated to forward their projects he already meditated and could have sent for this valet with no other intention than to dictate to him a language of that description because a confidential servant is supposed to talk may give an appearance of truth to what he utters especially when he relates matters of domestic privacy I was more intent upon considering the motives which could induce Mr. de Talleyrand to speak this language to me as I well knew how much he was thwarted by the return of the Bourbons, with whom his friendly intercourse was confined to outward appearances, by setting the Empress against her husband in such a manner as to exclude all idea of a return of affection, he prepared her to take part in the views which he meditated. Such, at least, was my opinion, and I think it was not very far removed from the truth. The Empress was still at Rambouillet, from whence she contemplated to depart on her way back to Austria, previously, however, to quitting France. A fresh insult was kept in store for her. Will it be believed, in fact, that the Emperor of Russia should conceive the idea of paying his respects to her? This is the more unaccountable, as it is difficult to suppose he could have overlooked the fact that this visit was highly unbecoming, for in short he could not imagine that his presence would be agreeable to the Empress, and the impossibility on her part of refusing the visit gave her a claim to the respect which he ought of his own accord to have professed towards her. He was unquestionably not the dupe of the stories told and propagated by Monsieur de Talleyrand respecting the Emperor's pretended harshness towards the princess, the Emperor of Austria, under whose auspices he presented himself was fully aware of the perfect harmony of their domestic life, and he had even occasionally expressed the mortification he felt at his daughter's enthusiasm for his son-in-law. He must no doubt have removed the erroneous impressions of Alexander if the latter ever entertained them. Had such coolness actually existed, he was less justified than any other member of the coalition in making it a ground of reproach to Napoleon, for he could not have forgotten on what terms he lived at home. His domestic troubles were notorious to all. Be this as it may... The following details were communicated to me by a person belonging to the household of the Empress and who was in immediate attendance upon her at the Palace of Rambouillet. She overheard the conversation which took place in the first instance between her and her father at which no third party was present and the subsequent conversation kept up after the arrival of the Emperor of Russia. The private etiquette of the palace required that the ladies of the Empress should always be attendants upon her. And at those painful moments, the ladies who had the honor of belonging to her household were more strict than at any other time in the observance of their duties, so that when the empress entered her saloon, some of them were in the adjoining apartment. At the palace of Rambouillet, this apartment happened also to be her bedroom. The emperor of Austria was the first to arrive, having got the start of the emperor of Russia. As soon as he entered, the empress was up the zone with him, and it was well imagined that a serious explanation would take place respecting the manner in which she had been treated. The conversation was attentively listened to. The empress gave her father a respectful reception and expressed great pleasure 
pleasure at again seeing him, but her tears plainly indicated her bitter mortification. At the part she was made to act, she was naturally gifted with a lofty mind, and on this occasion she was unsparing of the reproaches which her offended dignity so justly, justly called for. The Emperor of Austria, who was greatly attached to his daughter, could not succeed in an his endeavors to console her or persuade her by an appeal to her obligations. He, however, requested that she would receive the Emperor Alexander, who was on the road and would shortly arrive. The Empress turned pale with indignation, but in the condition to which she was reduced, it was no longer in her power to resist. Nevertheless, she did not exhibit to the eyes of the French the pitiful example of running after the man who had affected the downfall of her husband. Her first reply was a direct refusal uttered in the firmness of a proud and lofty mind, which revolted at the idea that the Emperor of Russia should so far presume to forget what he owed to her. The Emperor of Austria found no other way of calming her than by making the cause a personal one. He earnestly entreated his daughter to give him that mark of obedience and so far to assume a control over her feelings as to stifle her grief on that occasion, adding that all the consequences of an eclat on her part would recoil upon himself and that he was pledged to remove every difficulty on behalf of the Emperor Alexander who was near at hand and on the point of arriving. He had not yet succeeded in overcoming the resistance of his daughter who replied to him, What then? Will he make me a prisoner under your own eyes? If he compels me to receive him by entering this apartment in spite of me, I will retreat to my bedroom. We shall see if he will presume to follow me. The time was rapidly approaching, and the Emperor of Austria could get no promise from his daughter, who obstinately refused to give way. The Emperor Alexander's carriage was already heard approaching by the Grand Avenue of the palace, and she still persisted in closing her apartment against him. The moments were but short. The Emperor of Austria urged his daughter by the most pressing entreaties. She still resisted when the Emperor of Russia was entering the courtyard of the palace. The Emperor of Austria went to receive him according to the forms of etiquette and conducted him to the apartment where he had left his daughter. What an interview! What a situation for all three! The Emperor of Russia could not fail to read the effect produced by his visit upon those features which had for the last 20 days been bedewed with tears. He was probably ignorant of the situation of the Empress, who was informed of the smallest details of what had taken place in Paris previously and subsequent to the reception he had given to the deputation of Marshal. She was also acquainted with everything that had been planned against her husband and must have possessed an extraordinary degree of self-command to check her feelings on seeing the author of the bitter sorrows which preyed on her. The Emperor of Russia accosted the Empress with every apology for the liberty he took of a appearing in her presence without previously soliciting her permission, adding that he only ventured to do so under the auspices of the Emperor of Austria, who had obligingly consented to plead his excuse. He was lavish in his protestations to the Empress and requested she would condescend to apply to him for anything that concerned her as he should feel flattered at any opportunity of being of service to her out of testifying his anxiety to anticipate all of her wishes. This is the substance of the Emperor of Russia's language to a princess whom he had just forced to descend from the throne and from whose brows he had torn the diadem. He could certainly be at no loss to understand the sentiments she nourished in her breast. She accordingly replied to this profuse tender of services by a cold return of thanks, adding that she had nothing more to solicit beyond the mere liberty to return to the bosom of her family, the conversation dropped and the autocrat took leave of the empress. I was told by the late Countess de Brignol, whom I saw before her departure for Vienna, that no circumstance had occasioned so much pain to the empress as this visit to her. We must suppose the Emperor of Russia to have been apprehensive, lest the youthful sovereign, feeling justly offended against him, would beg to be excuse if he solicited permission in the usual form to present his duty to her and then he resorted to the expedient of repairing to the palace in the company of his ally the emperor of austria but whatever coloring may be given to this step there is nevertheless something so revolting in it whether in respect to form or to the rules of propriety as obviously to indicate its real motive 
On mature reflection, it will be found a spring out of the course adopted by the Allied sovereigns for the purpose of detaching the nation from the Emperor. It was no doubt imagined that the work would be the more complete if the Empress were lowered in the public estimation and held up to view as partaking the feelings of those debased minds who hasten to return their thanks to the enemy for relieving them from the pretended tyranny of her husband. The attempt, however, to impose upon her proved abortive. She was at no loss to discover the motive of the Emperor Alexander's conduct. She was possessed of too much discrimination not to form the only opinion on the subject which she was warranted in entertaining. A few days after this visit to Rambouillet, the Empress took her departure for Vienna. She passed through Versailles, Verrières, and Soissy, and stopped the first night at Grosbois, the residence of the Prince of Neuchâtel. At every place she was waited upon by persons who went to take leave of her. She traveled under an escort of troops furnished by her father and took the road through which the Allies had proceeded on their march from Bal to Paris. She passed in a lofty and dignified manner through the departments of a country where, at a like period of time four years before, she was married to the Emperor on the 8th or 10th of April, 1810. Travel arches had been erected on her passage and the road had been stirred with flowers. That country now beheld her departing as the last victim of the enemy who had laid waste to its towns and carrying away the pledge which but a short time before appeared to have bound her to the French by ties which no circumstance could possibly sever. Her heart was a prey to the deepest sorrow during this painful journey. Its bitterness was increased at every step. She felt no assuagement until her eyes were relieved from the sight of objects which contributed to nourish her grief. She carried away with her heart the regret of those who had enjoyed the happiness of approaching her and left with us the recollection of her many virtues. The emperor's mother had quitted Orléans for Rome with her brother, Cardinal Fesch. King Louis followed his mother. The king was failure repaired to Syria and Prince Joseph to Switzerland. The emperor's sisters likewise withdrew to a foreign country. We must now return to what was happening in Paris. Chapter 15. Since the emperor's abdication, that is to say, since the 8th of April, the war was naturally at an end as he was alleged to be the only cause of it. It had accordingly ceased, for the hostile armies had immediately entered into cantonments, and a line of demarcation had been drawn between the portion of the territory which they occupied and the country where our troops were distributed. The greater part of the French generals were in Paris. They had even some of their troops quartered in that city. The whole army had moreover acknowledged the provisional government and paid it every obedience as well as to its ministers, who were very assiduous in their attentions to the Allies sovereigns all were in expectation of the king's arrival, which could not be long delayed, as it was in vain to pretend to deceive him by the reports which everyone proposed to submit as to the share they respectively claimed in his recall to the throne, all hastened to bind his hands by a constitution rapidly procured from the Senate. The dupes alone were caught by such a snare. The Senate could no more give a constitution to the French than it could arrogate to itself the rights of Pronouncing the emperor's forfeiture, the king was possessed of a mind too far above those of political breaknecks to deceive himself respecting the true causes of his return that those agents of disturbance who had at all times deceived the nation by constantly betraying the weaker party for the benefit of the stronger were far from expecting the return of the prince whom they contemplated to persuade of his being indebted to them for the crown is proved by the fact that they had not even entered into any agreement with him. There can be no doubt that if they they had really intended to replace him on this throne and had been actuated by those motives of public interest, which they professed, they would have laid down certain bases and have required some guarantees. Otherwise, their imprudence would have been altogether un. Parallel. This reproach, however, cannot be laid to their charge. The king was brought back by the course of events, and when they found that it was impossible to resist his recall, that the intrigues had only turned to the advantage of the emigrants, they bethought themselves to claim the merit of a work exclusively owing to the force of circumstances and to consider as their own a result which was brought about in spite of them. The idea occurred to them of originating a constitution which they felt it of importance to obtain, first in consideration to their personal safety, and in the next place, as being a document indispensable to the object of obtaining the support of the French, towards whom they had no other means of persuasion than a proclamation of the king 
dated nearly 12 months before. They imagined that such a constitution would protect them from the consequences which they apprehended. Their mistake will soon be made apparent. I am aware, however, that Mr. de Talleyrand did not indulge in this illusion. He was not deceived as to the result that might attend the return of the House of Bruin and had not been unmindful of the object of averting the painful consequences to which it might be led in a point of view to himself. He stood in great need of money and had lost a yearly income of 300,000 francs, which he enjoyed under the emperor's government. He plainly saw that the king would not be able to secure to any one such large emoluments. The following fact will illustrate my assertion. Mr. de Talleyrand had purchased out of the proceeds of the hotel, which he had sold to the emperor, a country house named Sombris. At a short distance from Saint-Denis, the loss of his allowance deprived him of the means of supporting that establishment, which was attended with heavy expenses to him. He accordingly endeavored to dispose of it. No purchaser offered, but he felt it no loss to remedy this disappointment. He sent for the farmer general of a gaming house of Paris and proposed to him that he should become the purchasers of that property. The latter in vain declined the proposal. It was intimated to him that he had not been sent for that. He should meet the offer by a refusal. He must become the purchaser, and if the agreement to that effect was not signed within 24 hours, the contract for the gaming houses would be rescinded and granted to someone else. The farmer's resistance was unavailing. He had to deal with the head of the provisional government. He accordingly gave way and asked what was the price demanded for the house. He was told 250,000 francs, which he ordered to be paid. The same day fully determined that the gamesters should reimburse him the money and that the house would be disposed of to the best of his power. Mr. de Talleyrand must have felt some presentiment of uneasiness when he could dispose in this manner a property which he might otherwise find it difficult to realize. Let's return, however, to the position of Ferrance in respect to the enemy, who had disclaimed any intention of imposing sacrifices upon her, the king was expected. A day having been fixed upon for his arrival, it was easy to discuss the terms of peace at full leisure, since the struggle was at an end, and all effusion of blood had ceased. Nevertheless, the negotiation was entered into in the utmost haste. And the Comte d'Artois was made to sign certain preliminaries which deprived us of all our remaining possessions in countries which had been so long annexed to France. Fleets, arsenals, fortresses, constructions of all kinds. We gave up everything. Why did we purchase at so high a price at our mistress, which was in existence by the mere act of an emperor's abdication? Why did Mr. de Talleyrand, who was so well acquainted with the value of negotiable objects in transactions of a political nature, begin by depriving France of whatever she possessed? He consented to an immediate restitution of all that she possessed beyond her ancient limits, with the exception of Chambéry and some broken territory around that city. Tuscany, however, as well as Piedmont, Geneva, Belgium, the Palatinate, the fortresses with their ammunitions and provisions, Antwerp and her fleet, the arsenal and its stores all were given up to the enemy, and the Comte d'Artois was made to ratify this fatal agreement before he could have knowledge of what was proposed to him.